So, didn't the riding officers have any backup? They did. They had people at sea, uh, the colleagues at sea. They had sometimes had the dragoons on the shore. But this is an age when it's very difficult to communicate. You couldn't pick up your mobile phone and, and say, hey, you know, we need you all down here, and the, copter, the helicopter flies in or whatever. This is a question of really trying to organise people uh, in a really distant and murky way. But surely there must have been times when the authorities would have put the screws on and they had to deliver some contraband or something. Yeah, but it's actually quite difficult to gain a conviction. Uh, the local jury is likely to be packed with uh, sympathisers. Uh, JPs are involved quite often in the, the whole business. And you've got to prosecute the people at your own expense. It's often not worth your while trying. So we're not talking about rosy-cheeked villagers smuggling a bottle of Spanish brandy. We're talking about organised crime. This is very much organised crime. There's a lot of money involved and everybody in the village is likely to be involved in one way or another. The riding officer was a social pariah, met by a sullen wall of silence when he tried to do his job. But the community had a lot to lose. In the 18th century, Robin Hood's Bay was rumoured to be the wealthiest area in Britain for its size. This must also have been galling for the riding officer, who earned not much more than a farm labourer. And he had to pay for his horse. People who lived here, they earned the living by the sea. They were insular, they were close-knit, they were ship owners, they worked the ships, they fished. They, they were naturally suspicious of outsiders and, and something like a riding officer who was coming in to, to, to curtail one of their sources of income was, was certainly not a popular person. The smugglers used their local knowledge to outwit the riding officer, transporting goods through a network of connecting tunnels and passages. Even when the excise did manage a seizure, they were outmanoeuvred. In Robin Hood's Bay in 1779, the riding officer, accompanied by dragoons, captured over 200 casks of brandy and gin with 150 chests of tea. The town called on the crew of a smuggling vessel. After a pitched battle, the smugglers seized back the contraband. So the work of the riding officer had very little effect. The 18th century was also the age of landscape art. Designers like Capability Brown changed the course of rivers and moved mountains to redraw the English countryside. Now, he was at the top. At the bottom, lurking in the undergrowth, my next worst job. I'm now a hermit putting the finishing touch to this beautifully sculptured garden. All I have to do is stay in my cave and not speak to anyone or have a bath or cut my hair or cut my nails or have a wash. And at the end of seven years, and only at the end of seven years, I get paid. And believe it or not, this craze for having a hermit at the bottom of your posh garden lasted for a hundred years. Now sod off, because I'm not allowed to speak to anyone. Smelly, bearded recluses had a strong pull on the 18th century imagination, symbolising all that was unworldly and spiritual. Rich Georgians liked to show the world they still had a soul, but too busy to withdraw in contemplation, they hired eccentrics, romantics and misfits to do it for them. I'm still being a hermit, although quite frankly I don't like it very much. Mind you, at least I'm above ground. One hermit was forced to live underground, although for some reason he was allowed to take his organ with him. Another one was told that he wasn't even allowed to speak to the servants who gave him his food. And another was told that every time one of the guests came by, he had to go like this. But the thing that would have really hacked me off is that you had to keep on doing all this hermity stuff, even when the people who lived in the big house had gone away on holiday. Back in the 18th century, taking the waters was all the rage. Thanks. It does taste a bit foul, but they also used to bathe in it. It was supposed to soothe the gout, help cure the pox, and calm scrofulous skin, which brings me to my next worst Georgian job, the bath attendant. It may look like a glamorous workplace, but the bath attendants spent their whole working day up to their necks in this mineral stew. 
They were at the beck and call of pox-ridden clients who had to be lifted from their sedan chairs into the steaming waters. But what really makes it a worse job for me is the uniform. The idea of wearing for an entire day, maybe 10, 12 hours, worth of wearing wet canvas clothing, it would have been incredibly uncomfortable. On their heads they wore a hat, and from 1737 all the bath guides by the bath um, council um, orders had to actually have a tassel on their hat so they could actually be noticed and recognised in the water. And so would the bathing attendants actually have had to lower them into the water? Probably, with some people, certainly. Some people were very fit and they were only coming really for social affairs and, you know, just to have fun. But if you were very ill, then you would have actually tried to be manoeuvred to some place where you could either sort of sit or sort of stand or hold on to one of these iron rings. How did you hold on to the ring when you've got the water <laughs> down here? You wouldn't have been able to do it if it had been right at that level. But if you look at the wall here yeah. and you see the colour of the, of, the, of the stone, this is from the staining of the water. From so the that Georgian was the period. water level? That's right, yeah. So if you see the height that you and I are standing, we would have been barely above the water. Even if we would have sat on one of these... or. Um, seats, yes, you still would be sticking exactly, out. Exactly, yeah. It? And so you can see why people did hold on like that. So, was the water this colour? No, the water isn't quite that colour. It'd be the colour that it is today, more or less. But because it's got such a high iron content in it, as soon as it's here for any period of time, it stains the walls. But if you think about somebody who's actually a bath guide who's in this water, you know, day in, day out, day in, day out, you can see why the 18th century types who came visiting used to say these people with lacquered hides and describing the bath guides as if their, their skin itself had been turned this sort of strange orange, as if they'd you know, done too much fake tanning. There were only 12 guides to look after about 60 bathers in an era when people couldn't swim. And despite the presence of a sergeant at arms, the atmosphere was often unruly, with young boys dive bombing into the water. And the bath attendant had to handle people with hideous diseases. Some of the ailments would have been particularly nasty because you're, you're dealing with a society when you're looking at a mixing of people with open sores and open wounds and ulcers, all kinds of different skin ailments that would have all been in here bathing indiscriminately. So it's a kind of gravy of human detritus. Yes, exactly, yes. It's in, and the 18th century contemporaries often commented on that. And it's often talked about having a filthy scum on the top of it. Um, the bath guides have to sort of stay on and help clean out the pool afterwards. It's not a great job, is it? No, not at all. I'm doing all right. I've already been here two hours. I've only got another six years, 364 days, 22 hours to go, and then I'll get a pension of £50 per year. I'm a bit nippy, so's my skull, but at least I'm physically intact, which is more than can be said for the person doing my next worst job. Does Robbie Williams have a bad job? No, nor will Young. But the pop stars of the 18th century had a tougher time. They were superstars of the new craze of opera. But the price of their success was having to undergo the barbaric practice of castration. Dr. Peter Giles sings countertenor, the nearest we can get today to the sound of the castrato, but he admits it's a pale imitation. Who were the castrati? They're a whole breed of super male singers. And they came from the ranks of usually choir boys in Italy, and it nearly all happened in Italy. Why did they castrate these boys? Well, it stops the normal process of puberty. And it's got to be done when the boy is eight or nine, not much more. And it stops what happens, obviously, from the testicles, the testosterone starts to, to move in.